Hello, today we're going to start a four-part series about writing simple assembly for the RISC-V instruction set architecture, or ISA. This material assumes basic knowledge about number representation in binary and hexadecimal. We'll discuss the RISC-V registers, instructions to move data among registers in memory and addressing modes. In part two, we'll cover arithmetic and logic instructions. Part three, we'll go over control flow instructions and how to write branches and loops. Part four is all about procedures and the call stack. Our discussion today aims to get you oriented to begin to understand assembly source code for the RISC-V instruction set. The ISA, or Instruction Set Architecture, provides an interface between software and hardware. Today our focus is on the software side. From the software view, the ISA defines how to program the machine with instructions. It also defines the stateful elements that define the context of a process, that is, the value of the registers in memory for a given point in the execution of a program. This notion of process context is important to the operating system. Systems programs provide a layer of abstraction and modularity between application programs and the ISA. This helps code reuse and application portability. Here are the stateful elements of the computer that a program sees. The program counter is a pointer to an instruction address. In RISC-V, this could be 32 or 64 bits. The register file contains the registers defined by the architecture, such as the 32 general purpose RISC-V registers, X0 through X31. Some ISAs also define condition codes separately from the registers to store information about recent instruction results, such as integer overflow, inequalities, and zero valued results. In RISC-V, the X0 register is hardwired to zero. This means it is always read as zero and writes to it are ignored. Memory is logically viewed as an array of bytes that contain both code and data. The logical view is usually divided into several sections or segments. This is usually done at least to separate the program code, usually called text, read-only data, stack data, and program heap data. We'll revisit this later when we talk about virtual memory. An important thing to pay attention to when dealing with memory is the endianness. The base RISC-V architecture uses a little endian byte order, which means the little end of the word comes first in memory. So the least significant byte is located at the first lowest memory address of the word containing it. A program is a sequence of machine instructions and data created by compiling high level source and assembling assembly language source into object code that is linked to create the program. The format of machine instructions is defined by the architecture, which provides a one-to-one -one mapping to readable assembly instructions. This includes the opcodes and the operands of each instruction. So a given line of assembly corresponds to one machine instruction and vice versa. A program is created through a sequential process that uses a compiler to convert source code into binary object code, and then a link editor or linker brings together multiple object code files to create the program. At runtime, a loader, which is usually part of the operating system, brings the program into memory so that it can begin execution on the processor. Here's an example of a simple C source code and its equivalent RISC-V assembly. We'll be looking at several examples throughout this series of four videos. The C code here shows a function that makes a procedure call to plus, passing arguments X and Y. Then it stores the return value to the location pointed to by dest. The int C type is 32 bits in a 32-bit architecture. The first assembly instructions are making the procedure call. Before we dig into it, we need to know the RISC-V calling conventions in use. Calling conventions define how registers get used for procedure calls and returns. They are usually defined in part by the instruction set architecture and perhaps by the compiler and operating system tools. The application binary interface, or ABI, includes the calling conventions. They ensure that an application that follows the conventions and the ABI has binary compatibility across computers with the same ABI. Anyway, up to seven integer or pointer arguments are passed by registers A0 through A7. A0 is used to return up to a 32-bit value, and A1 can be used to return up to 64-bit values by pairing it with A0. More or larger arguments and return values are passed through the stack. This function has three register-sized arguments. So the caller will have put x in a0, y in a1, and the pointer to dest in a2. So the first, three the first three instructions are making room on the stack 
and saving the return address and the A2 arguments to the stack so that we can get them back later. The next instruction is jumping and linking to the plus function. This is how our procedure call is made. Stay tuned for part four of this series to learn more about procedure calls. The next few instructions are loading the value from the A2 argument and storing the return value from the plus call into the, uh, into the location pointed to by dest. Finally, the last three instructions are going to return from this procedure. We're going to return, load the return value from the stack, add eight bytes back to the stack, and return to the calling function. Let's focus on the line of C code that stores the value of the variable t of type int to the location pointed to by dest of type pointer to int. The dest pointer is the third argument to the sum store function. However, because sum store calls the plus function, we saved the value of the third argument to the stack before the call and need to restore it from the stack before we can use it. So the assembly instruction here is loading the value of the 32-bit address from the location four bytes offset from the stack pointer and putting that value back into the A2 register. The load word instruction mnemonic stands for the LW instruction mnemonic stands for load word, which indicates bringing a 32-bit value into a register from memory. Other architectures may define word differently. For example, Intel x86 uses a 16-bit word size. In RISC-V, we may also talk about double words, which are 64 bits, or quad words of 128 bits. Because T is coming from the output of a procedure call, its value is in the return value register A0. So the second assembly instruction stores the value from A0 to the address located at zero bytes offset from the pointer value in the A2 register that we just restored from the stack. When this assembly gets translated to machine instructions, it looks something like this. The first value, hexadecimal 400598, is the first instruction's address. Each instruction themselves are encoded in four bytes. The load word has the hexadecimal value 00412503, and the store word instruction has a hexadecimal value 00A62023. We'll discuss binary machine instruction encodings in a separate discussion in more depth. We can get the machine instruction addresses and encoding using a disassembler, which is a useful debugging and reverse engineering tool. The GNU compiler collection includes the OBJ dump program that can produce disassembly with a dash D flag. The output goes to standard out, so the greater than sign can be used to redirect the output to a file. Then we can open the file and look at the dump and see the instruction addresses, hexadecimal instruction encoding, and the assembly equivalent code. The quality of the disassembly will depend on whether the program was compiled with debugging symbols or if it has been stripped. Although a stripped program may be disassembled, the variable and function names won't be available, so it will be harder to understand than if you have the source. In general, you can disassemble any program, but some programs have an End User License Agreement, or EULA, that forbids you legally from disassembling and reverse engineering the program with some exceptions. Notable examples include proprietary operating system kernels and video games. Using disassemblers is an important skill for both systems programmers and security professionals. Now that you've got a taste for how programs are made, let's dive in the deep end. Here are the 32 general purpose registers of the RISC-V architecture with their mnemonic names. These are the registers that a program uses explicitly for integer operations. There's another set of registers for floating point operations. The general purpose registers are numbered prefixed with an X, from X0 through X31. Unlike other assembly languages, RISC-V tools do not use any prefixes other than the X for the register names. Some assembly syntax, for example, uses a percent or dollar sign before register names. Such syntax is not part of the instruction set architecture. We'll learn more about these registers over the next several videos. Probably the most common instruction in any RISC assembly language involves moving data between registers and memory. The LW mnemonic stands for load word and SW for store word. We saw these earlier, but let's take a closer look. Load word will copy a four byte word from memory into a register. Store word copies a four byte word from a register into memory. 
A memory operand identifies the address of the first byte in memory. Remember that because RISC-V uses a little Indian byte ordering, this will be the address of the least significant byte of the word. There are several ways of specifying a memory address called addressing mode. The displacement mode is used by default in RISC-V, which consists of specifying a base register and an offset to add to it. If the offset is just zero, this is equivalent to register addressing. These instructions are used to move four bytes between a register and memory. Here's a simple C function that takes two pointer arguments and swaps their memory contents. This code dereferences each pointer into a local variable and then stores each variable back to the other pointer. The assembly code does the same thing, but with registers instead of variables. The calling conventions ensure that the values of the XP and YP pointers will be in the A0 and A1 registers. The compiler allocates two caller saved registers T0 and T1 to temporarily hold the memory values. Because they are caller saved, they don't need to be saved and restored to the stack. The instruction moves the four byte value from the memory location addressed by A0 to the T0 register. The second instruction does the same, but from the A1 pointed location to T1. The third instruction then moves from T1 to the memory location of A0, and the last instruction moves from T0 to the memory location in A1. Let's walk through an example with some made up numbers. Well, suppose that swap was called with address pointers XP equals 0x120 and YP is hexadecimal 100. The first line of code moves the value at address 120 into the T0 register. Here I'm ignoring endianness and a bunch of leading zeros. The next line of code moves the value at address 100 into the T1 register. The third line of code moves the value from T1 to the address 120. And the last line of code moves the value from T0 to the address at hexadecimal 100. This function has many ways its assembly can be generated. Here is a second way to implement the same function in RISC-V by switching the order of the stores back to memory. After you understand more about how the processor works, especially about pipeline data hazards, you should have some intuition about which approach, if either, might be better.